as Muslims not being intellectually brave enough. Historians ought to be future orientated because the way that time operates in Islam is not linear. We're looking at history in the wrong way. The smallest strip in the world at the moment is literally bringing down a hegemonic empire. So decline does no longer exist in the Western Maya. So in Islam, everything is cyclical. I let the Ali in the Quran, he talks about, and those who think, mm. and those who contemplate, and those who listen, you become desensitized and conditioned into becoming a secular agent, even though you call yourself Muslim. Because we have the resources, we have the human capital, we have the minds. It's not like it doesn't exist, but we're stuck. It is said, a people without a past are a lost soul. And in today's turbulent world, the Muslim Ummah has come to realize that we have, in many cases, been taught a version of history that fails to appreciate what the late Dr. Shabir Akhtar called Islam as an imperial faith. In fact, our appreciation of Islamic history remains poor, or we see it as nothing more than a story to tell our children. My guest argues that history needs to take in a discussion about our future, and that historians are as important as traditional Islamic scholars. Now, I have the pleasure to invite back onto the show Dr. Yaqub Ahmed. Dr. Yaqub is an academic specializing in late Islamic and Ottoman history. He has until recently lectured in Islamic history at Istanbul University. He's a regular to his podcast and writes and lectures extensively on Ottoman history. He's the author of a soon to be published title, Does History Matter? History Done Islamically, which will be uh, the basis of our conversation today. Uh, Dr. Yaqub Ahmed, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and welcome back to the Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, thank you for joining us. Thank now, you. In the introduction, I uh, probably mentioned some controversial points. And uh, one point I mentioned is what Dr. Shabir Ahmed called uh, Islam, an imperial faith, which yeah. was a very controversial title, I remember, when he published his book. I mean, do you agree with, with that? Things have not changed still. And because of the current predicament, I have um, then came with this concept of writing this book. And so the, the questions you kind of pose, um, I'm just going to address a few of them because um they are something that, that has gone through my mind as well. Do you mean Gaza in terms of predicament? I think specifically Gaza has, um, clearly for me as a academic uh, historian and maybe a pseudo thinker, um, it's made me realize that I think we are not, as Muslims, not being intellectually brave enough. Um, I think we have um, been quite intellectually submissive or passive perhaps. And I think... Um, if there is a body, and you know, this this extends out prior to Gaza. I mean, there's been what's happened with the so-called Arab Spring and Muslims in various parts of the world. And I think um, the sort of like solutions that we were trying to um, provide, if we can call them solutions, have not been sufficient in regards to trying to create a, a creative third space. It's been very much status quo, solution oriented way of thinking. And Gaza sort of made me um, re-examine that because. Um, as I was going through the history books, and we can talk about this later, I, I sort of make the argument that Gaza is Badr-esque in the way that it's been sort of like played out. Um, it, the smallest strip in the world at the moment, in my mind, um, for all the hardship it's facing, is literally bringing down a hegemonic empire. Um, now, how long that will be, uh, Allah knows best, but the, the idea is, is that the reason why I say Badr-esque is not just simply because it's a conflict, um, but because the notion of Badr is to obey Allah, obey the Messenger, and so forth, and the, the idea of the, of the sort of like um, nature of the people of Badr, the sort of like um, characteristics that they display, the sort of patience and against all the odds sort of reality that Badr um, sort of represented. And not only that, but um, the sort of like moral after Badr, which is the idea that, um, you know, that Muslims have an expectation to be particularly upright. So um, what's unique about that is that it also resonates, and we'll talk about this probably later, about the idea of history rhyming and the notion of um, Dawood alayhi salam and Jalut. So there is a particular theme that we see throughout um, the tradition of Islamic history, um, of this sort of like um, uh, moments, that, that these contingency moments, which I call, that, that, that appear, that sort of um, um, are a sort of um, wake-up moment. And for me, Gaza has left me... Um, 
very disheartened and optimistic simultaneously. And the fact that as a thinker, I have, um, I've started to think that I, I need to be more vociferous and vocal in calling out the genocide for what it is. It is a genocide. But also as a Muslim, um, try to provide a sort of more solution-orientated uh, alternative mm -hmm. from the repository which I call the Islamic historical past and say, okay, look, what do I have that I can add to the conversation? What is, what is it that I know um, that I can put on the table and say, you know, we've gone through these particular moments. What have been the outcomes? Or yeah. um, have we gone through these particular moments? Is this specifically unique? And, and so forth. And then say, you know, look, Now's not the time uh, to be afraid and cower. I mean, if we're if I'm making the argument that the people of Gaza are re reflecting some sort of tradition or culture or manifestation of Badr, then the requirement is: is do I want to be part of that sort of like uh, greater process? Do I want to be included in that um, sort of like uh, relationship with Allah Taala of trying to show humanity of an alternative? And I believe that um, I need to be intellectually braver. I need to write um, far better in terms of what I'm providing in regards to solutions to this ummah. And um, I, I may not be rich. Um, I may not be the strongest person in the world, but I say this categorically, alhamdulillah, my mother never raised a coward. So um, I, I am a little bit disappointed, firstly, in myself, and then in Muslims around me who are of a similar disposition, who are privileged to be writers and thinkers and intellectuals and so forth who haven't, one, been brave enough to um, try to galvanize the community in a way which I think can be solution-orientated, and two, um, the solutions that we are proposing at the moment are just not good enough. Mm. Now, we could turn around and say, we don't know. That's okay. Um, it's okay to be collectively shocked and traumatized to the point that uh, the sloganeering that we put on the table is not sufficient. So, you know... It's easy for Muslims to um, make the case that Islam is the solution, or the Khilafah is the solution, or this, the Sharia is the solution. But that solution that you put on the table has to have something tangible that people can make sense of. Mm. That's where I would argue that my job now comes in, where I'm saying, okay, how do I make that imaginable for you as an alternative? How do I think of, or what do I imagine as possibilities post-Gaza? Um, well, what, 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 what do I envisage? how this will all pan out, how this looks like, and so forth. And so for me, um, I think as Muslims, we have to be, and this platform is, alhamdulillah, a good platform for that, in the sense that we have to be more uh, vocal in, in debating and discussing amongst ourselves, yeah. regarding the differences, in fact, and, and, and accepting the fact that we have these differences of opinion, but the only way we're going to find some level of synergy is to put it out there on the open. So, so that's what's driven me in that sense. Mm. And now got your point because yeah. I just did go off topic a little bit hmm. um, I think uh, two points before I go to Shabir Ahmed which is um, I don't think that history is a central form in regards to vocation because some people may accuse me as a historian of just uh, you know um, defending my vocation but I do believe it is um, in the past amongst Muslims it was a vocation which was not only complementary but supplementary to the, the framework of Ulum din um, the ulama were historians Ibn Khaldun is an example of that Al-Tabari is an example of that Ibn Ishaq is an example of that The ulama understood And this is interesting because Mustafa Sabri Effendi the, uh, Sheikh al-Islam of the Ottoman Empire Was a little concerned about history as a vocation Because he was an expert on Kalam in particular And he preferred certainty And he said where the problem lies with the vocation of history Is how do you determine that certainty now, the uniqueness about history is that it's an interpretive vocation. It's a mm -hmm. vocation in which um, interpretation is required as yeah. part of what we do. So, for example, my, one of my concerns is, is when I see sort of like um, history being done on uh, the Internet, and we call this bullet point history, right, mm -hmm. which is this, or PowerPoint history, which is this, 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 and this, and this. Yeah. And that type of history has a particular place, but what it happens here is when that history is being done is... It's presented as if it's factual, yeah. which is a little bit troublesome itself because is history actually a, a science or is it a, a different type of vocation? It's interpretive in the fact that the Ottoman Empire collapses in 1924. That's factual. Yeah. But if I said to you, Abdul Hamid II is a good man, 
that's not factual at all. That's now interpretive. Right. Irrespective of the evidences, there's an interpretive component here. But I believe that that vocation of thinking, that consciousness that's created in that style of thinking, is necessary in both the alim and non alim for Muslims in general. I think that needs to be put on the table as a, a, a way of thought, thought. And so that's why I think history needs to be done better. And I don't think we're doing a good job of it. Um, and I can say that quite confidently because I've been doing the circuit now for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing the questions that parents are asking me. I'm seeing the questions that people are asking me in the massages, in the madrasas. And then I've been teaching in the academic space itself. So for here, that's one. The second thing is, no doubt, I believe it's important um, in, in that sense. And this is why one of the things I want to encourage is that how do we incorporate that in our curricula in a way that can be informative and move away from this kind of sloppy bullet point way of writing history and make it more in terms of it being thought provoking. So now going to your point about Shabir Ahmed, I understand the point he's trying to make. Uh, whether he was deliberately being a provocateur or not, I, I'm not sure. But historically, there's enough evidence to show that at least in the center of what we call the Muslim world, um, it, there has been an imperial component in the way that politics has been um, uh, practiced. And as a consequence of that, the imperial culture has had a particular manifestation in terms of the various ways that the power configurations, and this would be the power at the top, and you can call this a khilafah for now if you want, or the sultanate or whatever it may be in any given time, mm. the ulama and then the ummah as a whole, how this triangle has sort of interacted with each other to sort of like represent the imperial culture. But I wouldn't use that particular term. I think I'm more closely aligned to someone like Naqib al in Malaysia yeah. or Armando Salvatore, who's a, his, um, a sociologist of Islam, in which he, he says um, Islam historically is a... Um, is a uh, tradition of civility, right? And I think Atas calls it adab. Mm. The idea that the notion of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi al-Munkar, or even in the Jama'ah, the Inna Allahi Ya'amru Adil wa Ihsan, the idea of goodness and justice, the idea of enjoining good and uh, staying away from uh, that which is not, mm. is infused in the culture of Islam to the point that all factions of the hierarchy are compelled to adhere to this general principle. Right. And that principle is can be seen from the local village to imperial politics at any given time. Mm. And that sort of like recognition that there is a superior canopy, which is Allah Ta'ala, which um, judges you in this life and the next, has consistently created a a civilization of this adab or civility that we can see. And that's then manifested in the arts, in the architecture, in the way that people behave, the morality, the ethics, and so forth. And so the reason why I'm reluctant to just simply talk about the imperial component, because Islam has manifested outside the Ottoman domains, outside the Abbasid and Umayyad domains, outside the domains of uh, Andalusia. Part, yeah. you know, Africa is, an, is a Muslim continent. In that sense, and we, we can go all the way to stretch to other parts of the world and we will see Islam sort of like um, um, internalized in that way. And so I, I like that sort of like conceptualization that they've put forward. Right, right. It sort of is in agreement with, with me in the way that when I look at Islam as a civilization, and I make this point because at times I've been disappointed when people have tried to point out that a particular leader was a tyrant or a butcher or so forth. And by doing that, what you do is you sort of make the case that we are no different than anyone else. Mm. And I make the case that we are different, actually, in fact, because Islam is different. And fundamentally, Islam manifested over 1400 years. You see a consistency. Mm. So yes, Muslims have committed misdemeanors, gone off script and so forth. It's not the, the point I'm trying to defend here. But by and large, the notion of adab and civility, and I use the Arabic and the English sort of translation, yeah. is very clear to see to those who study Islamic history properly. So I would be more um, interested in saying it like that, if that's okay. Um, in your book, you talk about how uh, historians don't just study the past, uh, but also provide solutions for right. the future. And what do you mean by that? Well, let me switch the question to you. 
Mm. Do you think we should provide solutions for the future as historians? I mean, I, I suppose we, we need to learn from history, of right. course. Um, but I've never thought about historians as being sort of part of this, uh, and traditionally they haven't been uh, part of this conversation about revival and about the future of the Muslim Ummah. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, I haven't seen historians to be a central part of that. So when we look at Western historians, that is true. But when we look at Islamic historians, it's a little bit different. Mm. Actually, even in the 19th century, Western historians in the Christian tradition and even in the Chinese tradition yeah. were future orientated, right? Now, fundamentally, the notion of Nabuwa, the notion of Dawah, the Quran itself are all future orientated. So any form of knowledge that a Muslim sort of like interacts with has to be future orientated. You can't not be that. So why would history be any different? Now, if we look at Ibn Khaldun, for example, and his the cyclical theory, and we'll talk about these ideas of patterns yeah. and so forth. Yeah. That is a way of being future orientated. The right. idea that you can learn from your past mistakes yeah. or the idea that you're going through a particular phase, you diagnose that phase so you know what the next phase is going to be and so forth. In that sense, the historian is being future orientated already by saying, me as a historian, I've seen this large tapestry mm. beyond time and space. And I've seen this particular way that people have behaved. And now I'm going to be a thought producer by saying, okay, look, we've been here before. Mm. Okay, look, we've had these moments before. Look, this looks like a troublesome moment. Yes. Um, this is how people operated when this happened and so forth, right? Mm. So in our tradition, in the Islamic tradition, very clearly, and this is one of the points I make in the book, is that Islamic history is, in fact, in my opinion, um, an apt sort of like critique or counter-narrative to Western modernity, mm. for sure it is. And this is the whole point of me saying it's a uh, tradition of civility. So in that sense, historians um, ought to be future orientated because the way that time operates in Islam is not linear. This is a very Western construct. So the Western notion is, and I'll, this sounds a bit outrageous, but yeah. so they have this idea that time is going up and it's progressing, right? Yes. So progress is in this linear line. Yeah. And as we've got to the modern period, things have got quicker and quicker. So we'll have like the Renaissance, then the Reformation, and now modernity, and then the pre-modern period is just this huge gap. Like mm. there is no sign of the future in this way of writing history because they will say that that's not in the sphere of what historians ought to do. Right. And so what you have is a space in which we call the continual present. It's always like what's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen tomorrow? So even if we look at the politics regarding Gaza, what are the alternatives? It's like, what's, what are the Americans going to choose in terms of what's going to happen tomorrow? The idea that you can say, okay, what can go beyond that? Can you think of the bigger picture? It's not there. So they've removed this notion of the future in many ways. Now, Islam is not like that. So what's interesting is when they became a progress-driven um, form of people in the way that you think, they removed the notion of decline. Mm. So decline does no longer exist in the Western mind. Right. So now someone like myself who's looking at America or looking at Israel and saying, mm, that looks like a decline moment. Well, they would never believe that because it's not part of their vocabulary even. It's gone, right? Whereas his, in the past, um, historians who were part of a particular religious tradition, irrespective of what that tradition was, had this notion in them. They were able to then say, okay, look, this we've gone away from a particular form of morality yeah. or we're showing a particular form of excessive violence or particular level of decadence, and the next phase of that is going to lead to some sort of, um, you know, combustion. And so, right. in that sense, here now you see that historians ought to do that. So in Islam, um, everything is cyclical. Yeah. So our lives are cyclical. We came from Allah Taala, we return, and it's not just the soul of the human being; it's everything in the cosmos, mm -hmm. including time. So we have a notion of the beginning and the end. And so it goes in this way. So for us, we don't have the flat lining of time itself. Yeah. yeah. And the Quran is really beautiful in the way it does that. And this is why you get people like Khaldun writing in the cyclical theories, the Ottomans writing in the circle of justice, mm -hmm. Malik bin Nabi, the Algerian colonial think decolonial thinker writing in this circular way, because Islam, in the way that we understand time, um, is very different in the way that time has collapsed in on us, in the way that the Western thinker thinks. And so the Muslim historian. Now, with that understanding of the way that we see Qadr Allah Ta'ala and time itself should be um, part of the conversation of trying to provide something different. Yeah. In, in the introduction, I mentioned um, 
that a people without history are a people without a soul. Mm. Um, your basic contention, it seems to me, in your book is that we're looking at history in the wrong way. Absolutely. Um, so what is it that we're doing wrong? Well, what is it that we're doing right? <laughs> you know, um, and, you know, people are going to, in the comments now, go after me and say, yeah. say, this guy is, you know, full of himself. Yeah. My frustration has been is that, and it has been frustration, um, is the fact that I guess what the vocation is is not taken seriously. Okay. And I'll, I'll give it to you in terms of a Western perspective and then my own um, sort of like experience. So there's a historian by the name of um, Gaddis. I forget his first name. John Lewis Gaddis. Absolutely. And, and, and Gaddis is an interesting historian from Harvard because he was concerned that postmodernism in particular was making the case that there's no such thing as truth and then making the case that history is just another form of fiction. And we just make things up and we put them onto paper and everyone has their own interpretation. And there is there is no real philosophy or methodology that's involved here. And Gaddis makes a conclusive, well, not conclusive, but a very strong case mm. that actually this is what we do as historians, right? We look at contingency, we look at continuity and change. Mm. We look at um, human agency. We look at context, complications. And then he also makes the case that historians have the capacity to um, scale meaning I can write a chapter that's about a hundred years or I can write a chapter for one year. Mm. That ability to scale out that the historian has, and we actively know we're doing this, right, is important. It means that we are intellectually aware of what it is that we're trying to do in regards to the reader. He talks about um, simultaneous, being like simultaneous at the same time, meaning when I'm looking at World War I in the Ottoman Empire, I can tell you, what was happening in Istanbul, Jerusalem, and Baghdad at the same time. Mm. But that wouldn't have, they wouldn't have known what was happening in Istanbul at the time. No. That's a privilege of me now being able to look and say, this happened, this happened, this happened at the same time. So he, he makes some of these um, arguments, and I think that they are, they are helpful. And then he talks about you know, uh, space itself. We can go beyond the, the, the space and so on. And these sort of like ideas that I've just mentioned, they're, they're lacking. Um, politics, for example, one mm. of the things regarding Gaza in particular is we keep saying, where's the context? And what politicians will do is they will not give you the context as a way of absolving themselves for whatever act it is that they want to commit, in this case, the genocide. Mm. And you can see continuously those who are trying to make the case regarding October the 7th will continuously try to provide the context. Yeah. Say this is, this is not beginning of October the 7th, it happened before that. Historians are well aware of the importance of context, whereas other vocations like journalism and politics and so forth will remove the context and the complexity out. Mm. So as a historian, I'm aware of this. And, you know, like Gaddis's argument, I think, is helpful here. Now, going to the community itself, all of this, what I've just put on the table, is irrelevant. Mm. What they just want to know is, fighters conquerors of Istanbul. Good, bad. Give me the bullet point history. This happened, this happened, this happened. Let me pull out my mobile phone and just list through it. Yeah. I'm saying that's not what you you deserve better than that, is mm. what my point is. It's not that I think I'm better than that. Yeah. It's that as a community, you deserve better than that. You deserve a, a, a vocation which was part of your tradition, a very intrinsic part of your tradition, in which it elevated at least the thinkers and then became part of the, the manifested soul of the collective, where they were... Um, complex peoples and they understood that it was now we are shortchanging ourselves because people will come up to me and say um can you prove or disprove this point yeah i'm like look well, what are you doing can you give a, come to the masjid as a token historian and just talk about such and such subject mm. because we want to put you know bums on the floor yeah. and 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 i feel like it's not just a a, a disrespect in regards to the notion of ilm itself in regards to what we do here mm. It's, 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 it's disrespectful to the self. Like, why are you asking to learn knowledge in this way when someone like myself is telling you that there is another way of doing this? Yeah. And so the book is an appeal both to Muslims who are aware of this, actually. They'll come to many of my um, presentations and talks and they'll say, Do, what sort of books would you recommend for our children? Mm. Um, what sort of curricula do you think we can create? Mm. Um what are the pitfalls of this book? And those are the right questions because they're aware 
instinctively that this corpus that's been created in this current field is counterproductive to the Muslim experience. They, they don't feel represented in it. And so there's a demand for it. Yeah. And the issue is, is the demand has now created a space which can be monetized and popularized. And so the monetization is happening mm. and it's happening on a very superficial level. And so that's my critique. I never came into this for money. I came into this because I fundamentally believed that this was something that um, is important to the community. And so this is the conversation. Yeah. I mean, you, you talk there about you know, how we're shortchanging ourselves and how the sort of awam, the, the normal person on the street um, just wants bullet point history. And, and you've got these YouTubers who provide them with these quick bullet point mm -hmm. histories and you take out a lot of the interpretation and the uh, conversations around history. Um, and uh, we just want to know black and white. And I think that's probably quite true. Uh, however, are you are you not being a little bit idealistic when it comes to how the ordinary man or woman needs to need to view history? I mean, I, I would imagine people in your trade, the academics, would be would have those tools and would study and would do PhDs like you and and um, and fine tune their approach to history. But you know, the, the local guy down my you know local mosque, he's not got the time to to study that level of history. He just wants to know the basic facts and, and, and how that's going to impact him and, and maybe, yes, right, you know, how that's going to help him for the future. Um, you know, are you calling for a, a an intellectualization of the Muslim ummah to that level? Before I answer that, do you think I'm being like this? I, I, it's, it's a question I ask myself about many disciplines, actually. Yeah. You know, how much should the ordinary person know about political science mm -hmm. or how much should the ordinary person know about sociology or whatever it may be. I mean, you know, that's why we have specialisms and that's yeah. why we go to people with, with specialism. Or maybe we get a glimpse of how much does someone know about usul al-fiqh, yeah. right? Um, you know, the ordering person probably doesn't need to know too much about usul al-fiqh, but yeah. maybe an appreciation would be great. That didn't answer the question, though. No. Do you, do you think, I, I'm not being offended, I actually yeah. want to know because I'm, I'm trying to hear, listen to this um, yeah. in, in terms of this conversation. Yeah. Would you... In your interaction with people, in the way that history is being done, I feel and, uncomfortable being on the other side of the, no, the question. This is a, you know, we're brothers here, and you know, like I said, I think we need to open up a head space and trying to yeah. be solution driven. I think it's difficult, surely, Yakub, for you know, people have finite bandwidth, they've got yeah. finite time, and and you know, find you know, some people in the academic space or in the pre-academic space, your students, your university students, will certainly have a greater appreciation of the tools yeah. and the conversations that you're you're immersed in. Uh, but I just wonder whether you know the guy down Al Jalal Mosque. Yeah. It's not named after me, but Al Jalal Mosque. You know, my local mosque yeah. uh, would really have the time to and the bandwidth to do that. This is a conversation that I've had before hmm. because. Um, I've been doing the circuit for 10 years and it's not yes. something that um, I, I, I say I'm not doing anymore, although I am saying <laughs> that I'm not doing podcasts anymore. This uh, is your last podcast. You there, there's one more to come and then that's it. I'm, I'm out. Um, yeah. But, uh, and I'm sure in the comments, they'll be like, yay, this yes. is great. You know, get him off. You know, what does he know? <laughs> He's not a real historian. Um, <laughs> so I'm not against the idea and I'm not trying to be a purist in the sense of, um, you know, I'm saying that everything has to be high end. Mm. So, um, and that's in all walks of life, you know, um, whether you want to just go to your local chicken and chip shop or whether you want to go and have a proper meal. Chicken cottage. Absolutely. Yeah. But the point is, however, that the concern I have, and this is what I'm raising here, yeah. it's not the idea that people don't have the right I'm making a point by using this platform to tell those who are doing what they're doing um, that one, at times, what they are doing is a little bit problematic for me mm. because um, they are not being um, careful with the examination of the ideas they're putting out there. Mm. They are being, at times, quite flippant. Right. And we, as a community, have become... Ex wonderful consumers of information mm. but the production of ilm is not at the same equivalent right. and as a muslim this idealism now if we're going to use that word and it's not something i'm offended by at all i think there is something in islam that encourages the idea of knowledge production knowledge internalization and dawah mm. 
to continuously be a manifestation of improvement. Mm. And so for me, it's not simply a job of facilitating the, the wants of the consumer market, which I will call, yeah. of what Muslims think is the order of the day. My job is to also educate and tell them what they need to know. True. And here, this is what I'm doing. I'm saying, if you want to have a slapstick version of history mm. for 20 minutes, mm. that's fine. But understand that's what you're getting. Yeah. That's what it is here. So don't be then posting up on WhatsApp groups, like, you know, as pseudo intellectuals, yeah. that you've understood the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. You haven't. Mm. And so here is what you, someone like myself is trying to encourage in the community, yeah. which is what you're getting is baseline. But there is something that can be done that's better than that. Right. And so what I want in our community is those who are studying political science, those who are studying journalism, those who are doing fiction and so forth. When you see this, this is ingrained in Western culture. When you're reading Lord of the Rings, Tolkien is a history specialist. Mm. C.S. Lewis is a history specialist. When you're reading Dune, he, he was a history specialist. Even when you're reading Orwell, Orwell is a well-read individual regarding the history of his people. Right. That is in the culture. That is manifested within a particular... Now, you can say that's just amongst the elite class who are writing, but no, because everyday people in Western societies are engaging with those works, yeah. which means that it filters through. And so for me, then, the complaint is that um, we need to do something better than that. And that aspiration, which may not be possible by me or in my lifetime, is still an aspiration I hold for Muslims. Yeah. Um, in terms of their knowledge production. I think if we want to get the type of change that we want in the world right now, mm. then we are going to have to stand up and be counted and say that what we've been doing is just not good enough and we can be better. Mm. By doing that, you have to set yourself higher standards. Yes. And that's what I'm trying to propose, perhaps. But I'm in no way trying to say that from time to time. Mm. And look, I'll give you even more of a worrying concern I have. Because nowadays people are using artificial intelligence as a way of taking their history on board. Yeah. And that's concerning for me because I just told you it's an interpretive vocation. So they're taking AI history as being fact, when in actuality, that's not what history is. Yeah. So this, once again, this idea that what is the point of history and the point of history from the Islamic perspective, and probably we'll talk about that later, mm. is when Allah Ta'ala talks about history in the Quran, what's he doing? Yeah. What's the point of it? Well, let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. because you do you you dedicate a good chunk of your book to the Quran and how it can be mm -hmm. utilized as a historical text, maybe, or even a, a tool of uh, a tool for the historian or the tool of historical analysis. Mm -hmm. um, explain that idea to me, please. So, um, Muhammad Iqbal um, writes in his uh, reconstruction of Islamic thought. Mm. Um, he mentions history. Mm. And one of the points he makes is that both nature and history in the Quran are specific forms of sources that Allah Ta'ala speaks of, um, ayat, science, um, as a way of um, getting the reader to contemplate. Right. And that's really important because history then, from the perspective of what the Quran is pointing to, it's not pointed to bullet point history. Mm. It's pointed to contemplate over this. Yeah. So Surah Yusuf, okay, for example, like when we're reading Surah Yusuf, we are contemplating over each ayat and the whole narrative that Allah Ta'ala puts forward. And in literature, this is called um, um, the creation of narrative communities. A narrative community is a community that has been curated by the author. Mm. The author writes in a particular style and creates a, a readership for the person who's reading that um, particular book. In this case, it's the Qur'an. Mm. So Allah Ta'ala's narrative community is the Ummah, first and foremost. Mm. People can argue it's for humanity by and large, but there is a particular way of understanding what's taking place in the Qur'an. And so when you're reading history in this sense, Allah Ta'ala is using these historical moments to shape your iman, yeah. to shape your character, to give you a sort of like, even a moral, um, at times quandary, and at times a form of contemplation. Right. And so the idea of history in the 
context of what Allah Ta'ala is doing in the Quran is to make you contemplate. And so as a historian now, my point of when I'm writing is what you realize in when Allah Ta'ala writes about um, history in the various forms is you realize the history of human beings is so vast that it leads to nothing but humility mm. because you realize okay, this has been the vastness of what we belong to. And then you realize, um, but that requires a clarity of the knowledge giver to appreciate what's taking place here. And so when I'm reading about, you know, whether it's the French Revolution or what happened to the people in Hokkaido in Japan, to the transatlantic slave trade, there has to be a moment in me as a human being who has to try to put myself in those shoes and go, okay, wow, what's going on here, right? Mm -hmm. That's the point. It's And the Qur'an is beautiful because, look, Allah Ta'ala in the Qur'an, He talks about, and those who think, mm -hmm. and those who contemplate, and those who listen. Yeah. So the Qur'an is naturally um, addressing your akli perspective, your reason, your rationale, right? It want, It's actually encouraging, and we were talking about the awam, but look what the Qur'an is doing. Yeah. It's trying to elevate people right. by trying to um, change them into being contemplative people, the ones that think. Um, and Allah Ta'ala even creates layers to this, the Muslim, the Mu'min, the Muhsin, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, in that sense. Now, so you're, you're, you're reading this, but Allah Ta'ala is moving your emotion. Mm. It's moving when you read Surah Yusuf. It's moving when you read Surah Maryam. It's moving when you read Surah Kahaf. It moves you. What's interesting here is your emotion is not a weakness. Mm. It's part of your disposition. And in fact, um, imagination is part of your thinking faculty because it's a unique faculty of insan themselves. It's we as human beings who are imaginative. You don't see cats and dogs being imaginative. <laughs> the idea of being able to exercise your imagination with your rationale is what moves you. That's what the historical narratives are doing in the Quran. That's what we should be doing. And that, coming back to the previous point, is not what we are doing. Mm -hmm. We are, and this is why I say we are we're shortchanging the Muslims to some degree. And that this is why I'm making or trying to engage in a conversation at least for the next generation, perhaps, to say, would you be willing to engage with the points that I'm putting on the table? It's not an attempt to belittle anyone, but just say, you know, look, this is my frustration because this is what I've been doing. And would you be willing to do the same? Ibn Khaldun, you uh, talk about Ibn Khaldun in your in your book. Uh, and you've mentioned him in today's podcast. Mm. He's a uh, uh, maybe a polymath, but you know someone who certainly knows uh, history uh -huh. and talks a lot about history. Why is he so important an individual for us to be engaged with? So there has been. I was watching a, a Facebook video a few month, weeks back where yeah. there was a critique by an Arab scholar making the case that Ibn Khaldun hasn't written anything substantial in regards to his history works uh -huh. in comparison to Muslim scholars before. Yes. Although I would say that Ibn Khaldun sort of like streamlined them out. But what he did do is he created a particular methodology of how history ought to be done for Muslims at that time. Right. Which was very unique. Really? Uh, nobody had, um, had done that before. He made the case um, for the importance of history being a discipline and a vocation. And he made the case of the idea of why we need to study the nature of human beings. What's the point, right? And 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 then the idea of as human beings being civilizational, mm. um, and in that sense, um, his critique at the time of Muslim scholars um, was based on the fact that he would say, for example, that you know sometimes Muslim scholars are not um, checking the facts correctly. Sometimes certain scholars, it's clear that they didn't have the ability to check these languages. Some of these scholars have used a particular language which is indicate a form of exaggeration. He wasn't questioning their sincerity, but he was making the case that these are particular methodological problems that can exist in the corpus of the work that we have created as Muslims. So he's not absolving us and creating this rosy picture, right? Mm -hmm. Now where today um, the issue may be is the fact that um, Khaldun may not have been able to anticipate ideologies of the contemporary period. Mm. The ideas of Marxism, the ideas of post-colonialism, the idea of decolonialism and so forth. But these do have problems in them themselves. So mm. one, Khaldun very clearly sets out in his main muqaddama, the first chapter is on history itself and mm. its importance. And he makes the case there's two types of history. There's the, the shallow history and the deep history. 
and he says that you know we should be focusing he goes there is a need for shallow history at some space for youtube but, history yeah and and look they're the, I, I i'm sure they're going to get the most hits right but then he goes but but uh, you know, those who are practitioners in this field should mm. be orientated towards a more deeper form of history writing. Yeah. And then, obviously, everyone knows Khaldun's theory, which he um, establishes about the cycle of rise and fall. Well, tell us about that, the cycle of rise and fall. So Khaldun is um, of the opinion um, at his time of making an assessment that um, all states, um, and he was looking at particular North African nomadic states, but they, his, his theory can be stretched out to looking at the the nature of all peoples mm. in terms of how they start as you know a sort of like um, a in, in the beginning there's a particular vigor of, of a particular idea that emerges and then there becomes a particular strength from that and then there's a particular level of we become sedentary and then a particular level of corruption and then it leads to a cycle of collapse and mm. he tried to estimate the idea of this is between 111 and 120 years each state that's the longevity. Now, what's interesting is actually um, time is a variable that um, we cannot um, make sense of. That's in the realm of Allah Ta'ala. We, we all know this. Um, and the reason why this is important is because when we're now looking at Khaldun's attempts to try to make the case of particular stages states or civilizations go through, um, you can then see that he's not off the mark at times of making these particular diagnoses. And he's not wrong because the human being, the average human being is that you're born, you're fit, you're healthy, you grow up, you're at your strongest point, yeah. then you get older, weak, and then you die and so forth, mm. right? So that's the cycle of the average human life. Yes, But not every human being goes through that cycle. Some people die when they're young, some people can get hit by a car and, yeah. and so on, right? Yeah. So there are anomalies that I think should be taken into consideration mm. regarding Khaldun's theory. Yes. But it's a good template, at least, that has been um, very um, influential. So when you have the Algerian thinker Malik bin Nabi, um, who who starts writing after Algerian independence from the French, yes. and he also writes about this cyclical theory, and he sort of like reads a lot of these sort of like French intellectual works um, to some degree, and then is inspired by Khaldun, reads the Quran, inspired by that, and tries to create an alternative cyclical um, theory. Um, and Malik bin Nabi says the same That the first group of communities When they're at a spiritual level They're at the most vigorous level And then they get to a rational stage mm. And then after the rational stage He would call the material stage Where become, people become individualistic mm. And once they get to that individualistic moment That's when we start to see A sort of like Tanking of a particular solar force Now the difference between Khaldun and bin Nabi Is that civilizations may have a longer stretch So an example The Umayyads a part of the Muslim civilization and it continued with the Abbasid civilization and the Seljuks and the Ottomans. The the British and the French were part of a Western civilizational bloc, you can say, even though they were competing, mm -hmm. and then it was taken over by the Americans. Mm -hmm. Whereas Khaldun is talking about states themselves, the Umayyads, the Abbasids, the Seljuks, the Mamluks, right? Mm -hmm. So here you see that states may have a longer shelf life, where civilizations, because the baton can be passed on, mm -hmm. can have an extended shelf shelf life in that sense and so this is the point that they're trying to make um you also talk about um how um good muslims in inverted commas make good historians and maybe make good producers of knowledge mm -hmm. uh what is it about islam that that gives us uh gives us that sharpness so the, the case would be that a good muslim who's internalized the sort of like aqidah of islam mm -hmm. and and place that within their knowledge production so one of the biggest arguments I've made in the book, perhaps, is that um, our works don't have Allah on the page. And I see that as a egregious crime, right. perhaps. Um, any historic, you got Francis Fukuyama behind you, any book you read, whether it's written by a Muslim or non-Muslim, mm. um, it's not giving you any indication of your salvation. It's not giving you any reflection of the one that created you. Yeah. And this is problematic because... Um, Look, so for example, I've mentioned Surah Alak before, but here I'll use it in a different context. When Allah says, Ikra bismi rabbika lazi khalaq, khalaq al-insana min alaq, ikra wa rabbika al-akram al-lazi allama bil kalam. The idea is, is that I created human beings from a, a clot, a fetal stage. You are at your most humble form. 
it reminds you of understand what you have come from. You know, you were just that, and I created that. Remember that. And then I am the one who taught you knowledge. I am the one who elevated you. So I took you from here yeah. to here yeah. in terms of this elevation, right? I'm the one who taught you the names of everything. I'm the one who gave you inspiration. I'm. It's because of you, because of me, you have thought in the first place. And so imagine that the one who created you and the one that taught you knowledge and the one that gave you thought and the one that gave you life, because that's what you're speaking about here, is the one that you ignore in your knowledge production. Mm. It, it's just... It just irks me that that's not, and you've heard me in conferences complain about this, because my argument is is that the sum totality of the knowledge that you produce, which is devoid of this central component of what it means to be Muslim, mm. is missing. Yeah. And so, naturally, in your intellectual capacities and even in your soul, Allah Taala becomes invisible, and if He's invisible on your paper, and then it's invisible for people now in the secular realm to see him outside. Mm. Then where is he? And why do people do this? Well, the secular worldview doesn't give the permission to Allah to exist. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Like me as an academic, right? If I imagine started off writing as a Muslim, yeah. like Ibn Khaldun, like Ibn Ishaq, and started centralizing Allah Ta'ala on the paper yeah. and saying my whole objective, the whole the, the main purpose of knowledge is for the one that created me. And my main purpose of knowledge is regarding my salvation in relation to this. And the way that I ought to write history ought to be in a way that can help me be connected to that or understand that or be attached to that is missing. Then even if I'm writing about the Sharia, Fiqh, Ulama, Khilafah, but where's the one that created me? Mm -hmm. He's not there. So it still becomes an abstract exercise, right? Yeah. So when... In Hadith Jibra'il, um, Rasulullah is asked, what is Ihsan? Yeah. He says, Ihsan is that you can see Allah, even though you can't. And He can see you always. So where's the Ihsan in my work? Where is the visibility of that? Mm -hmm. And so what happens, and people don't realize this, is you become desensitized and conditioned into becoming a secular agent. Mm -hmm even though you call yourself Muslim. And that's a problem. And that's a very harsh position I'm putting on the table because every Muslim scholar now is going to have a go at me on this. Yes. But my argument is, is that even though what we might be writing is profound, it's still the lowest form of knowledge because the highest form of knowledge should be one of attaching the human being to the one who created them. Right, that's the objective. So a Muslim scholar now, and this is going back to your question, because I had to qualify that, yeah. is the one who's orientated with their knowledge production with that in mind. Mm. And so what happens is then when you're writing, you're aware that because you're accountable in the eyes of the one that's created you, you are extra careful in the way that you produce your knowledge. You are extra careful of your footnotes yeah. and your language, and you're extra careful in the way that you carry yourself. Mm. The idea of arrogance and hubris is not acceptable and we are doing this as Muslims. We will talk about Muslims of the past in very flippant ways. Mm -hmm. These are not people here who can defend themselves. So we'll go, oh, Khalid bin Walid, you know, he did this, did that. No, what are you talking about? We're not sitting at a pub having a conversation. These were people who did magnificent things for Islam. They're human beings. They've made mistakes. And there should be a particular decorum in speaking of them. Because on the day of judgment, when those people say, Dr. Yaqub, <laughs> Yaqub, forget the doctor. Jacob spoke ill of me and he put it on paper for people to read until the end of time. Mm. What sort of defense do I have for myself? Yes. So in that sense, the Muslim who truly understands in totality what the point of ilm is. And ilm is dawah orientated. It's action orientated. The idea of ilm is not just to put information on the paper. It's to, like I said, it has to be salvational. Mm. right? And the Muslim here is different in that sense. And the Muslim scholar ought to be different. And I feel that within the space of academia, not only did I start to feel suffocated amongst my colleagues who were non-Muslims, I felt like an outcast regarding my colleagues who were Muslim because they felt that the proposal that I was putting onto the table mm. was something which was ludicrous and not fit for the academic space. Mm. So then I've said, okay, then I'm now not going to do it in that space. I'll do it in an alternative space. But it doesn't take away from the fact 
um, that I'm still intelligent. You can still write. So this is the third space I'm talking about, which is, you know, um, how do you do that? And one of the ways you do that is you have a good grasp of Quran and Sunnah. Mm. So when something in history happens, you can relate it to the Quran and the Sunnah in some ways, to making that case. Another way of doing that is the idea of providing morals and values and lessons. Yeah. This is what we do. We, we provide those values and lessons. And we, we say, what, what, are the, what is the moral point here, both when Muslims have done something good or bad, so that you take something from it? What are the lessons that you can take from that, right? Um, what is the um, the con the aspect of contemplation of this, and how, what am I bringing to the table? And I think that's what I mean by the Muslim scholar here now. That this is what the Muslim scholar, as an alternative, needs to um, put onto the table. Mm. And I'm making that proposal to anyone who's listening to this today. Can I can I ask you about? So you, you've talked about soundbite history or bullet mm. point history, and you've said mm. that that's not a really good way of doing history normally, um, and there needs to be a an intellectual ascension in mm-hmm. Muslim Ummah. Um, uh, do you have the same aversion to uh, fiction? Um, so Eritreal comes to mind. You know, mm. we know very little, as you said previously, mm. about Eritreal, the father of. Uh, Osman Ghazi, yeah. uh, Ghazi, but we do know that, you know, um, we know a little bit, fragments of information, but we've got, mm. you know, lots of seasons of editorial that I've I've seen over a number of period of years. And it's it's really, you know, given me and lots of Muslims, mm. you know, a, an enthusiasm to learn more about history. Right. But I suspect you would probably say, well, apart from that little fact and season in, you know, the first episode, the rest of it is is pretty bogus, right? It's all fictional. Um, do you have the same aversion or problem or anger with that type of history? You know it's not real, right? I do know it's not real, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, no. No. Oh. I think it has a place to exist so long as you recognize it is fiction. Yeah. This is the point here. Um, a lot of, um, like I said, uh, post-colonial thinkers made the case that historians are fictional writers. And why? Because there are many tools that we are sharing with people of fiction. Mm. We're doing storytelling, narrative, sort of character building. We're creating a world for you. We're creating an imagination mm. and so on, right? So that's no different in that sense. But where we are different is that we are restricted to proof and evidence. Mm. We will say that, look, the reason why I make this case was the fictional writer has no need to do that. And nor should they have a need to do that. Mm. I just explained to you that the Quran... Um, um, addresses your imagination Imagination and creativity Is part of the disposition of human beings That should be part of our culture So I have zero problem with fiction In fact the argument I make Is that people who are historically grounded mm. And have a good historical consciousness Can write fantastic fiction yeah. Because all forms of knowledge Require a repository mm. So when you're watching the Game of Thrones I don't know if you've well, watched that or not But the idea of the Game of Thrones was that When he was writing He was using many moments from his historical consciousness in terms of what he was reading about English culture and, and so on, right? When you're looking at Japanese anime, for example, the idea of something like One Piece is that he's using historical references in Japanese culture, yeah. which young Japanese kids can resonate with in that sense. Um, when you're looking at the Battle of Algiers, the idea is, is that that's actually not a documentary. It's fictional. In fact, what happened in Algeria was far worse than what was in that documentary, right? But the Battle of Algiers was really interesting. Why? Because it was inspirational to people like Lucas, who did Star Wars. Mm. Star Wars was fictional. But Lucas, in a conversation with James Cameron, makes the case that the rebellion are representatives of the little people who were taking on a technological empire like the British and the Americans. People were aware of that. When Lucas put out um, Revenge of the Sith, this was the complaint by the Republicans who were supportive of the Bush administration because they just invaded Iraq. Avatar, so James Cameron, then takes his leaf from his book and does exactly the same. Yeah. In that sense, um, you know, and, and they used to say, like the PLO, the Black Panthers, the IRA, they took inspiration from the Battle of Algiers. Mm. Fiction is a powerful medium of moving people in regards to, once again, contemplate. What I would argue, however, is the Muslim fictional writer should be aware of this fact. Mm. One... What is the purpose? Are you just creating this for entertainment? Because part of the Western culture is this sort of like commodity of fiction and the way it's come close together. But the idea I would say as a Muslim is maybe we should do it within our own prism, which is one, we want to tell beautiful stories and even maybe challenges perhaps of the past and, and curate it in a way 
in which we can speak more truth in the fiction than we can times in the academia and give these correct, I mean, look, writing includes metaphor, analogies, and narrative, and mm -hmm. we can do that. So I'm not against Arturul. My problem was not with Arturul the show, mm -hmm. was the fact that Muslims took it for being fact, because once again, we've become accustomed to thinking that history is fact. And it was a TV show, but I mean, what it inspired in people um, actually did a, a wonderful service for me. Yeah. Because then people want to study Ottoman history. And the first thing I did is told them that the show is not real. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so yeah. Yakub, is there a methodology from Islam uh, in the way we do history? I think there was a methodology from Islam in the way that we did history. Yeah. I think looking at 2024, I think as Muslim scholars who are both, um, who have taken the, the sort of like tools from academia, and have the ability to go back to our tradition, I think we need to try to fashion something um, again from our process. So like, for example, I, I told you about Orientalism and um, Marxism. Mm. So Weber was the one who coined the idea, the Oriental despot. Mm. And he's the one who coined the idea, the Sultanism. Yeah. It's an idea that, that stuck in the Muslim mind, but it was a construction by Weber himself in the way that he looked at the East as one block, mm. and in the way that he looked at Muslim politics in particular. Right, But the way that the Muslim politics actually worked was very different than what he was proposing, but we've internalized that. Yeah. So you can see, like for example, Marxist writers, who at times may be sympathetic towards Muslims, yeah. are still very antagonistic towards Allah Ta'ala. Of course they are, they reject him. Yeah. So um, the key is here is that how do we write in a way uh, which is in, in conformity, um, which can firstly take the tools that we've, like, like, Gaddis puts on the table. I think those are universal ideas of selectivity, yeah. of um, you know scale and so forth. The idea of complexity, the idea of context, the idea of contingency and so forth, right? Um, so one of the things I didn't mention to you was we said that in Islam they have these cyclical theories, right? Yeah. And I saw, but I was, uh, I've coined this idea of um, from Badr to Uhud. And this idea that in Islam, we've had Badr moments and Uhud moments continuously. Yeah. And contingency moments are really interesting because you have a cyclical theory where you're trying to anticipate something, but you can't anticipate a contingency moment. So as a historian, I can't use my faculties to tell you there's going to be an earthquake tomorrow. Yeah. I just can't do that. I can have a discussion with you about the decline of the American uh, empire, but I can't do that. I can't tell you who's going to win in the war that's currently taking place. I don't know the outcome of that. And that's interesting because we have these contingency moments like um, epidemics, like natural disasters. Nabo is in, in, an interesting moment because Allah Ta'ala directly intervenes by sending a prophet yeah. to try to change the disposition of a group of people. And then there's well, war literature. And Western historians write extensively about war literature. The war historians in the West are... You know, there's so many of them, like, and and they they shape policy on this. You know, um, both Bernard Lewis and Kissinger were, you know, heavily invested in this sort of way in terms of curating foreign policy for the American administration in regards to what to do in the region. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting about war is it's a culmination between the Qadr of Allah Taala and human agency to the point that we really don't know what the outcome is going to be. Mm. Right, um, and so in Islamic history, then I started looking at these moments, right. And what's interesting is you have Badr, and then you have Uhud, and Badr has a particular quality to it in the way that um, Islam speaks about it, and then Uhud has a particular component and quality to it, and like why these two issues are so different. And throughout Islamic history, then I say we have these like Badr and Uhud moments, right. So I say, for example, 1071, the um, the Seljuk defeat of the Byzantines in Manzikart, Manasket, Anatolia, is, you could say, is a Badr moment. Mm. And then in 1099, the Crusaders take Jerusalem, Beit al -Mabdur. That's an Uhud moment. Mm. And then in another 18 years later, you have Salah Adina hitting 1181, right, roughly. Yeah. That's a Badr moment. And in 1258, you know, 70 years later, you have the second of Baghdad. Mm. You have an Uhud moment, right? And then you have um, Murat Hudavandigar, who, um, the Ottoman Sultan, who makes it all the way to Kosovo, 
the Balkans come under the realms of the Ottomans, the yeah. Badr moment. And then, you know, decades later, you have the clash between Timurlane and Bayezid, and you have your Uhud moment. And then Fatah's conquest of Constantinople. But then you have Muslims being kicked out of Spain. And it, there is some lessons to be learned from this, yeah. in this sense, in these ups and downs. What's happening here, right? In terms of well, what, what is it that we're, we're looking at in terms of these contingency moments? Well, what is it that we take from this? Not only the morals and values, but you also realize that this is a continuum. And one of the interesting things about Muslims, which is different, I guess, Iblis said to Allah Ta'ala that he wanted to be alive until the end of time. Yeah. So Satan. Right? Yeah. And Adam alayhi salam was generational. He was going to pass knowledge down generational. And this is a, a unique facet of human being. And the Muslim tradition has strongly taken that culture on board mm. of being generational. Even though we go through these various stress moments, these various moments of violence, of outside intervention, of genocides and so forth, but the ability to continue to survive is because we are generational as people. We keep passing down that notion of civility, mm. right? In that sense. So why is this important? Okay, so now 1071 is Manzikat. Yes. And then 1099 is look here is um, Crusaders and then Hitten happens here but during the Battle of Manzikat um, the Seljuks are able to institutionalize the Nizamiya Madrasa system right. Nizam al yeah. you have Jawaini and Ghazali yes. you have the emergence of um, a intellectual renaissance they recognize Ghazali is alive during the Crusaders mm. he dies in 1111 so there's a recognition in the Muslim world even though they couldn't stop 1099, but the movement of knowledge production, of the awareness and so forth, continues. Now, what do you get in about 1144, Imad ad-Din Zengi, mm -hmm. the Seljuk Bey, who's driven by this knowledge production, who's, who's shaped by this knowledge production? And then what do you get? Nuruddin Zengi. Yeah. So Imad ad-Din defeats the Crusaders at Urfa, and then Nuruddin Zengi defeats the Crusaders at Bilal Shah in Damascus and Aleppo. And then Hitten is possible with Salahuddin Ayyubi. So what's the Badr moment? Is the Badr moment Salahuddin Ayyubi's 11 or is it Imad ad mm. And so what you realize is these ways of looking at long jury history is you can see these moments. Wars are like this and knowledge is a lot slower yeah. like this. So right now, today, what we're seeing in Gaza there's a sense of helplessness yeah. in terms of the inability to do something. But we still produce solutions that are driven for now and they should be future orientated mm. for that future that we cannot see so that it can look different. And this is why knowledge production is so important that even though this is devastating and even though we're trying to, from the rooftops, shout as loud as we can to try to stop this and there's a unwillingness by the various forms of leadership mm. to stop this. Yes. But then as a knowledge producer, I still have to be future orientated because that's the culture of Nabuwa. Mm. Going back to now the method of writing history, right? So as a Muslim then, going back to everything I've said, this is what we need to do. So what is the the idea that I, I, I propose onto the table? Is um, I make the case of Hadith Jibrail, which is the Hadith of pedagogy, yes. which is the famous Hadith in the Nawawi collection where he, Jibrail al -Islam, comes and he meets Rasul in a gathering. Yes. And he sits knees to knees with him. So imagine. So he comes as a man. Comes as a man. And he sits knees to knees with him. And everyone's just like, who's this guy who's come from the desert? Not a speck of sand on him. Looks perfectly um, clean and so forth. What's going on here, right? Mm. And he, the idea of knees to knees is important because in terms of teaching relationship, what has Jibreel Islam done? It's closed the distance. What does the internet do? It creates distance. This is why, once again, about the bullet point history is a concern I have. Because teaching mm. is about having closed the distance between the ones you are teaching. Because you are a reflection of the knowledge that you're producing. Now, Rasul knows who he is. So when Jibreel salam asks him the question, he goes, okay, what is Islam? Rasul salam is aware that I'm not the one being tested here. We together are teaching everybody who's, of, who's sitting in, in presence. Actually, the hadith is interesting because it's not just teaching them, it's teaching every single person, including you and me, who are reading, reading the hadith about what is Islam. Yeah. 
So then Rasulullah says, Islam is la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And then pray five times a day, zakat, hajj, and fasting. So it's a very simple answer, but it's a very profound answer. What you learn from here is that they're using a Q&A format to reinforce a particular idea for the audience that they've already gone through. They've already been taught by the Prophet. Right. Yeah. But this Q&A is being done here. And what's ha interesting is Rasul says it in the most simplest form. So on the one hand, I'm making the case that your writing should elevate society, yeah. but it should be written in the most simplest form so that even a regular person can understand it. So as an academic, once again, I've put all these ideas on, but the point I'm making is that when I'm writing, I'm aware that it shouldn't be beyond the scope of people's understanding. Mm. And the second point of that, what is Islam, is ibadah. We are here for worship, mm. right? So what's important here is that the Muslim needs to understand their shahada. What is the testimony of faith? And two, that what is your worship? And then he says, what is iman? And he says, Iman is the belief in Allah, the belief in the angels, the belief in the books, the belief in the prophets, and then Qadr of Allah Ta'ala and the Day of Judgment. Now these two points are really interesting for the historian because how in the historian I should show some way of one reflecting for Muslim audiences at least, the idea of Iman. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't feel ashamed of the idea that we believe in angels, mm -hmm. that we believe in Nabuwa. That we believe in Allah. These, these are Iman components. So I had a student once ask me, how do I convince someone of angels? I said, this is an issue of Iman. This is why. They need to be convinced of Shahada first before you can bring that to the table, right? But then there's the idea of the Qadr of Allah Ta'ala. This is an important point. On the paper, at times, the agency of human beings is missing. But the agency of Allah is missing in the narrative and the way we tell it. We don't make the case that and then this is the Qadr of Allah Ta'ala. We should be highlighting that to the reader so that they're aware in the, in, in the lived experience and then in the written experience, it confirms it. Mm. At the moment, what we're confirming is the absence of it. Yes. And then the last hour. And the last hour is important, and I'll come back to that in a second. And then he says, what is Ihsan? And like I said, he said, Ihsan is like you can see Allah. Okay, then we need to see Allah. We need to put calligraphy of Allah's name. I need to make my lived experience in the way that when you see me, you mm. think of Allah, right? And in the paper, we're not doing that. So as a historian, these are the points I'm making. Now, Jibreel Islam then says to him, so tell me when is the last hour? Mm. And Rasulullah says, the one who's asking the question knows just as much as the one who's answering. Meaning it's the realm of Allah knows only. So when Ibn Khaldun is creating these theories, time is a, a, an issue that we can't really know. And the point of me as a historian is not to try to give you when will something end. I can't. That's in the realms of Allah. But I understand a particular pattern that I can explain to you, perhaps, right? Um, in that sense. And then what does he ask? He asks Rasulullah, okay, give me some signs. Mm. And then Rasulullah mentions particular signs. And those signs are important because what it tells you is that Rasulullah is future orientated. So then the historian ought to be future orientated, this particular form of methodology. Now, then, when Jibreel alayhi salam leaves, what does Rasul salam do? He turns to his best student, Omar bin Khattab mm -hmm. and he says to him, do you know who that man was? And he goes, no, Rasul, you know better than me. He, he did the Q&A. He asked him a question. And he asked him the question in an environment of absolute confidence and interaction and love. Mm -hmm. And the humility of Omar bin Khattab, he says, I, I don't know, you know better. And then he says, he's Jibreel alayhi salam. And they didn't turn around, everyone in the room, and go, what are you talking about? They went, okay. And so that hadith itself, in terms of methodology, tells us a lot about how the Muslim ought to start to curate their knowledge production as a historian, perhaps, in terms of giving meaning to Muslims. Because this whole hadith is, is, is known as the sort of like the mother of Sunnah, understanding it. It's, it, it's the it's sort of, um, the heart of how we produce knowledge Why we produce knowledge What's its purpose mm. And so I think this is what Muslims Ought to start looking at Their own tradition And how it tells us And informs us About how we're producing this knowledge And so this is what I want to do um, I want to put Allah back And it's interesting What is Islam? Mm. Allah is at the center of it What is Iman? Allah is at the center of it What is Ihsan? Allah is at the center of it mm. Every single time And so For me My appeal is 
not to tell Muslims who are in academia not to write academically, because that's the they may just cut off halfway through this podcast and just yeah. start freaking out. Yeah, they can produce that form of knowledge. Just it's Hudaybiyah, for example, when the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was done, and then they said, "Why did you put Al Rahman in there? Take it out." Hmm. And Rasul Sam says to Ali ibn Talib, "Okay, take it out." And he goes, "No." Why? Because Ali ibn Talib and the Muslims understood what that meant. Just like what Western academia does. They understood that by taking this out, by extracting this, mm. you are making the curator invisible. And then he says, take out the word that you're a messenger. Mm. We don't accept that. Mm. Now, Hudaybiyah was a, was a contract, if you can call it, but it was a temporary measure. Mm. But knowledge production is permanent. So the, um, the Muslims who... Who, who, who were frustrated by that I, I agree with that sentiment That you can write your books In academia and so forth But there has to be equally A n culture of knowledge production mm -hmm. From our printing houses To our syllabi To our curricula To the way that we teach That's centered on this type of intellectual tradition And that for me is not at the same level And it, it's frustrating Because we have the resources we have the human capital. We have the minds. It's not like it doesn't exist. But we're stuck in this current framework of the status quo. Mm. And I'm saying now, looking at October 7, saying, you know what? We need to change. We, we really need to be braver. Mm. And we have to be braver with our relationship with Allah, fundamentally. Mm. And, um, you know, there can be times where you... You can be selective in what you want to put in your work. But the general knowledge corpus for the next generation. Otherwise, they're going to become accustomed to writing knowledge where Allah is just invisible. And, and, and I, I, I don't accept that. And I refuse to accept that. And so for me, the, the highest form of bravery then is not the, the, the critique of Western academia or the critique of colonial studies or the critique of... The, it's, the, it's the egregious crime of not allowing, not permitting... Allah, so, and power does this. Power will not permit mm. another form of power to be visible on its form. Mm. And how dare we as human beings become so arrogant in assuming that we can remove the one that created us from our knowledge production. So this, this is where I stand now. And this is uh, my position. And I'm going to go on that 100 miles per hour. Dr. Yaqub Ahmed, Jazakallah Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Anyways, thanks for having me, bro. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.